Hillary Price began working as a freelance copywriter for San Francisco ad agency immediately after her graduation from Stanford. At the same time, she peddled her cartoons to the San Francisco Chronicle, where they were published every few weeks in Sunday Book Review opinion section. In 1995, she started Rhymes with Orange, a daily and Sunday comic strip that appears in about 150 newspapers nationwide. Her ambition is to think like Roz Chast, draw like George Booth, and have the chutzpah of Sam Gross. She would also like to inspire more women to become cartoonists. Sage Stossel is an editor and a cartoonist for the Atlantic Monthly Online. She is a regular contributor of cartoons to the Boston Globe and the Provincetown Banner. She received a 2009 New England Press Association Award for her work for the Province Banner. She first published her cartoons as a college student when she did a weekly strip about college life called Jody for the Harvard Crimson. Her cartoons have been featured in the New York Times Week in Review, CNN Headline News, Cartoon Arts International, the New York Times Syndicate, the Boston Globe, Editorial Humor, Copy Editing, and elsewhere. Her work is also included in Best Editorial Cartoons of the Year for 2005, 2006, 2009, and 2010, and in The Attack of the Political Cartoonists. She's also a children's book writer and has two books out, On the Loose in Boston and We're Off to Harvard Square. First, let's hear from Sage Stossel. Welcome. Um, thank you. Um, let's see. Well, I know that one focus of this evening's discussion is intended to be um, how the parameters of different cartoon forms um, can either promote or cre constrain creativity in different ways, and then also um, within different kinds of pictorial storytelling, what's the interplay between the words and pictures? So what role do the pictures play versus what role do the words play? And um, first off, I guess I would just say it seems like a very timely moment to have a discussion about um, the implications of different kinds of cartoon forms because at the moment the field of cartooning and the form of the cartoon seem to be in an unusual amount of flux. And I think some of that has to do with uh, transformations in the newspaper industry um, as the newspaper industry is sort of struggling and undergoing change and downsizing um, an older uh, business model that's been a major support for a lot of kinds of cartoons is kind of giving way. And so as one business model gives way, new ones are emerging. And in some cases, they're not really emerging yet. And so it puts a big question mark on um, various types of cartoons and cartoonists and how can they reinvent themselves to be financially viable. And um, oftentimes it is the, the um, business model that dictates what the form can be, like how much space can there be, can it be in color, what will the platform be. Um, I think another factor that's sort of changing cartoons in recent years have been uh, technological ones. Um, the internet obviously has been around for a while now, but um, a lot more cartoonists now are sort of bypassing the syndicate system and attracting a big following online, and then they just um, earn money by selling merchandise related to their cartoons or by um, selling advertising on their sites. Um, then there are other new platforms emerging all the time, like the iPad and the Kindle and things that we probably don't even know what they are yet, um, unless somebody leaves it on a bar stool in California and gives us a preview. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, as, as these new forms emerge, a lot of times with it comes uh, an expanded sense of what a cartoon can can do or be. So, for example, um, just last week, the Pulitzer Prize for editorial cartooning was awarded to a freelance cartoonist named Mark Fiore, who actually does animated cartoons. And um, that was the first time that the Pulitzer had gone to something other than a traditional static drawn collection of cartoons as a submission. Um, animation's a kind of an area that a lot of cartoonists are starting to try their hand at, especially, I know in editorial cartooning that's the case. And the um, Pulitzer Committee conferring this award on an animator, I think kind of gives its imprimatur to that 
field and says this isn't just some fringy thing that's way out there. It's acknowledging that the definition of a cartoon is um, evolving and the, becoming more inclusive these days. And I think it's also heartening to a lot of cartoonists to hear the story of this particular cartoonist who won because he was a traditional editorial cartoonist until a few years ago when he got laid off. And then instead of become quitting and becoming a graphic designer or selling insurance or something, he um, started this new course. And so I think it signals that what can seem like the end of the road might actually be an opportunity to, to sort of try a new direction, hopefully. Um, and then finally, there's uh, the 800-pound gorilla is the uh, advent of the graphic novel on the scene as a kind of high art form of cartooning. Um, by now, it's kind of a familiar story how in the late 80s, Art Spiegelman's mouse sort of exploded onto the landscape with his uh, two-volume exploration of his father's experiences in the Holocaust. And that kind of opened people's eyes to the fact that cartoons and the cartoon form could actually be used to explore really weighty subject matter in in-depth and nuanced ways. Um, and since then, there's been a whole slew of critically acclaimed and commercially successful graphic novels coming out all the time. The New York Times seems to set aside space to review graphic novels that have recently published on a regular basis. There are even um, master's programs springing up to teach cartooning as kind of a high art form. So whereas it was more almost a trade in the past where if you wanted to learn, you would apprentice yourself to somebody who could teach you the inking and the lettering and that sort of thing. Now places like the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont are getting founded that are, they're conceived along the lines of places like the Iowa Writers Workshop just happen to be for cartoonists instead of writers. So the understanding of what a cartoon is and can be and the, the issues it can deal with have uh, significantly expanded and kind of moved beyond an older notion that might be more about cartoons as kind of light entertainment, maybe a little bit jokey, sometimes involving superheroes. Um, and that raises an issue which I think is up for discussion tonight, which is how does the advent of this high art ambitious form of cartooning um, impact the older forms? Does it in some way elevate them with reflected glory or does it um, diminish them or devalue them as you know, frivolous and obsolete? Um, my own sense is that I don't think it necessarily does either. I think they can kind of coexist as two different, two different um, forms that each have their place and their value. I don't think anyone would say that these lower forms have at last evolved out of their amoebal pri primordial form into the, their ultimate realization of what a cartoon was always meant to be so they can just wither off and disappear. I think um, somebody can pick up a graphic novel and spend a week with it and um, you know, two weeks with it, and uh, you know, absorb its insights and admire its artistry and be compelled by its story. But at the same time, every morning, check in with their favorite comic strip and um, each week with their favorite New Yorker panels and be following um, editorial cartoons. And I think they get different things from that. I think, especially with the regular cartoon features, I think there's a kind of friendly familiarity that develops, and it's kind of like checking it with an old friend. It's, you recognize the drawing style and the characters, and if something happens in the news, maybe you wonder, you know, I wonder what Dan Wasserman or Tom Tolles or Sidney Wilkinson make of this event, and you can go check. And so it's kind of an ongoing thing. I mean, not quite a relationship, but a little bit more than sort of a discrete object that, you know, sits on your shelf. Um, and even if it's just, a, a one-off cartoon, you would never seen that person's work before and you stumble on it in a magazine. I think that if it gives you a moment of insight or uh, makes you laugh out loud or articulates something that you believe in in a really apt, um, punchy way, I think people find that valuable and meaningful. And I think that's why so often you see cartoons clipped out and taped to people's stuff because I think they're saying, you know, this cartoon speaks to me, I, I identify with it, and I'm putting it out here because I want it to speak on my behalf to other people. So I think of it kind of like that children's book, The Little Red Lighthouse and The Great Gray Bridge. They each have their place and their form, and they each have their value. Um, so anyway, I thought I would just briefly talk about some of my own experiences with a few different forms that I've worked in. Um, my first experience cartooning regularly for publication was um, in college when I did a weekly comic strip um, with a set cast of characters. 
and one central character, Jody, who was kind of my cartoon alter ego. Um, and that experience was kind of what impressed on me the notion of cartooning regularly as a, in a weird way, kind of establishing a relationship between the audience and the cartoonist because um, I was kind of shy, kind of asocial, didn't get out much, but I was sending this cartoon out every week and Jody, the character, and her friends and roommates would be, I'd be having them deal with things that were my genuine preoccupations and all that. And it was very gratifying because the, I did it all four years and the strip became pretty popular. And so from very early on, people, random people I didn't know would call me up and say, thank you, I could really relate to this or that. Or over time they would recognize my name if I um, needed to get a library book out, I'd give them my card or I would go to a party where I didn't know people or something and they would recognize the name and it was like I was a long lost friend. And they say, oh, I had a dream where this character did this and what's gonna happen with that character? Um, you know, it was kind of weird that these things that I was manufacturing out of my head that people seemed to have feelings about them. Um, and it was, and, one, I, and I, I struggled with coming up with ideas each week. It wasn't easy and um, one time to give myself a break, I did a, just a surreal one with no words in the bubbles and there was like a rhinoceros walking by and somebody was getting into a clothes dryer and it was just totally weird. But I went out to class and when I came home, the phone had been ring, ringing off the hook and my roommates had been taking all these messages. And there was one that I saved because it was somebody I didn't know who said like, yeah, this person has a number of questions about this week's Jody. Um, he says, you have a responsibility to your public. He depends on Jody every week. So <laughs> I thought that was nice. Um, but anyway, so, so I graduated. Um, Jody graduated, and that was the end of the strip. But um, I should mention, so cartooning has never been my day job. I've always done it around the margins of whatever else I've done. So since then, I've picked up a variety of different cartoon gigs. Um, one is the Globe, which I'll talk about separately because it's somewhat different. The other three, just as it happens, are panel cartoons. And um, one is for the Atlantic Monthly website, which is also where I've worked essentially since college, and I do current events cartoons for them. Um, one is for a cartoon, for a, a publication about copy editing, um, which is interesting, it's a very narrow subject matter. I always think I've come up with the last possible cartoon that could ever be done, and then I have to do it again. Um, and then uh, for the Provincetown Banner, a few years ago, I started doing a trade-off every other week with a, a person who lives out there who does cartoons. And I don't live there, so I just have to read the paper really carefully. Um, but the generating ideas for these topic-based cartoons has been a different experience from the strip, because for the strip, it was the interplay of the characters' personalities or a story arc that I would set in motion, and the ideas would come from that. With the topic-based cartoons, it's like I have to ingest information and crunch it around in my head. So I'll read the national news, I'll read um, about copy editing, and I'll read the Provincetown banner and the hope that um, something comes together. In terms of the form, um, these are all kind of the jokey type. This is not high art graphic novel style. So the dynamic is kind of, you set it up, and then you have kind of a punch, so it's kind of like a serve in tennis or something. And so with the comic strip, I would have two or three panels that I could do my setup and exposition, and then if the strip was working, there'd be a, some sort of punch to go in the last panel, and it was clear where it went. Then there, um, switching to a panel was kind of like moving from a house to a studio apartment because everything is in one space, and um, so I have to organize it really carefully. Um, because you want to choreograph the order in which the reader absorbs the information so that they still get to the punch last and that they've been primed with the setup plus whatever context you want them to have. So if it's about current events or something, you can make decisions like do you set the context with a caption at the top or do you put somewhere, try to subtly put a newspaper with a big screaming headline or do you have somebody work it into conversation early on and you have to try to make it sound like normal people talking, not just broadcasting news headlines. So, so those are some of the considerations with the panels. And then finally, the Globe stuff was a complete fluke how it came about. It dovetails well with the issue of the words versus pictures question because um, basically what happened was I'd been working at the Atlantic website for a few years. I'd been doing editing and things like that, but I was thinking I ought to get my hand into more writing. And so I managed to get myself a freelance assignment to, with the Boston Globe Ideas section to cover an editorial cartoon convention that I was going to. So I was excited to do that, and I went to the convention, 
And I came back and my head was full of all sorts of things from the cartoonists were all so cool and the panels that I had sat in on had so much, so many discussions of new directions. And, but when I sat down to write, it was just a big hash in my head and I couldn't put it together and it was just kind of getting worse and worse and I was getting panicky. And I was working with two editors at the idea section and um, one of them, Jenny Schusler, said to the other, Wen Stevenson, well, she's a cartoonist. She's doing it about a cartoon convention. Can't she just do it as a cartoon? And so this was suggested to me and I sort of grudgingly thought, well, all right, I don't want to completely fail them and give them nothing, but it still felt like a failure because the whole point was I was trying to write something. But when I started thinking, how would I do it as a cartoon, suddenly it sort of came together like, oh, okay, I could walk through it this way and start here and it would end here and I could go through these steps with these details. And so it kind of worked. And then it came out and the feedback was good and the editor said that the feedback internally at the paper was good. So then I erased from my mind that this was you know, a failure and you know, suddenly I was all excited. This is this new thing that I could do, kind of address events and issues through the uh, visual and cartooning prism. And I ran out and got um, a little notebook that I always carry with me that um, they're like uh, index cards with lines on one side and blank on the other and um, pen that I carry with me all the time. And just started looking for things that I could cover as I would come across them. And um, interestingly, the, the process is backwards from the other cartoons that I do. The, with the other cartoons, it's like I think the whole cartoon concept in my mind, and then it's almost a, a last step afterthought to kind of flesh it out with a picture on the page. With these, it's a matter of um, going to an event or looking at a theme and just getting all these pictures and jotting notes and listen, jotting down things like over here and that kind of thing. And then I go home, so I have the pictures first, and I spread it all out on the floor. And then that's the hard part for me then, is just can I make this hang together and cohere in a way that makes some kind of sense? And can I walk people through a series of these that, to something that feels like some kind of a conclusion or a punch or um, destination of some kind? Um, Although I, some, I do it the other way too. Sometimes I'll just riff on a subject, in which case I'm thinking it up and then drawing the picture second. But my drawing style is a little different if I'm making it up out of my head versus looking at something directly. So I try to make that not obvious that it's a different drawing style. But, so those are the different forms that I have worked in. And um, sometimes if I'm thinking of an idea in the early stages, I'm not sure which venue it will work for or which form it will take. Um, it sort of develops later on. It's kind of like an airplane and like which airport do I have it land at? And then sometimes it goes somewhere else completely. So um, last year I was toying with an idea about Facebook and it was getting really wordy and then I just thought, well, I'll just get it all down and then I'll figure out how to cartoonize it afterwards um, and which venue to kind of shoehorn it into. But when it was done, it was just all words. And so it ended up running as a straight humor piece in the Atlantic, which I was very excited by, but it was not what I had been trying to do when I set out. So I think it's neat as cartoonists to have two tools in your arsenal to kind of cover events, but I don't necessarily feel like I have complete control over which one ends up being the one that works. So anyway, I guess I'll leave it there. So, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, before I tell you my history as a daily <coughs> newspaper cartoonist, I th thought I'd share something about the history of the daily cartoon strip, which I learned when I went to see Art Spiegelman talk in Somerville, Mass., a few years back. So at the beginning of the 20th century, newspapers were the CNN, the NPR, the Huffington Post, the Drudge Report, and the Cambridge Forum, all in one. Um, each city had three or four or five papers that competed against each other for readers. So in New York City, there was a bitter rivalry between the newspaper that was owned by Hearst and the newspaper that was owned by Pulitzer. So they were always looking for an edge to get readers. So Pulitzer decides that he's going to buy a fancy four-color press and reproduce the great works of art to the masses. So he buys the press, he spends a boatload of dough on it, and when he goes to print the Mona Lisa, she looks like she needs an airsick bag. So now Pulitzer's stuck with a very expensive color press that couldn't do rich, beautiful color blends. 
but what it does do well is simple, straightforward, flat colors. So Pulitzer hires an artist who draws funny pictures of a little hooligan boy in a yellow nightdress saying things with the, the funny things that he says are written on his yellow shirt. This is pre-word balloons. And then the yellow kid becomes really popular with readers, draws them in. So then Hearst sees that and he hires the artist who does the yellow kid from the Pulitzer, Pulitzer paper on over to the Hearst paper. Great. Then Pulitzer sees that and says, he hires another guy to draw the yellow kid at his paper. And thus the, do, the daily newspaper comic strip is born and intellectual property rights take another hit on the head. This ends the educational portion of my talk. <laughs> but I can tell you about, the, I, I clearly remember the day that I joined the ranks of professional cartooning and it was between my junior and senior year at Stanford University. By between junior and senior year, I don't mean just the summer. To my parents' dismay, I had decided to take the entire year off. And for part of the time, I'd left the States to explore Ireland. Why Ireland? Was it the poetry, the history, the, little, the landscape? No. It was Lucky Charms commercials. I'd been a sucker for the accent ever since I heard pink stars, orange, Orange, wait, pink hearts, orange stars, green clovers. Already I'd spent three uh, months in Dublin and my employment record for the first time in my life was spotty. I'd quit the cocktail race waitressing job I'd had at the pub after another one of the owner's spitty tantrums. As I went to collect my last tips, the bartender said to me, that man is so tight-fisted he gets up in the middle of the night just to see if he's lost any sleep. My next job at the pizza place lasted only a week. I was fired. The manager's parting words to me were, you're a lovely girl, but you're slow, and you seem to invite trouble wherever you go. It dawned on me later by, that by slow, she'd meant developmentally slow. And then it dawned on me a few days later that I should have gotten that a few days earlier. So when my parents decided to come visit me in Ireland, I was ready for some TLC and a chance to play tour guide. This was a very fateful move, as Dubliners pride themselves on their rich literary history. And places all over the city pay homage to the darling of AP English, James Joyce, with his signature round eyeglasses. So on the first day, Mom and Dad and I are walking down the grand promenade of, of Dublin, O'Connell Street, and we come to a giant bronze sculpture of the city's native son. Mom, uninitiated, sees the man in the glasses and goes, oh, look, it's Elton John. <laughs> so I'd come across a, a humor magazine in Dublin that had single panel New Yorker type cartoons. And after my week parents week long holiday, I bid them goodbye, went back to my flat and drew up the Elton John cartoon as well as, well as uh, a couple others. I found the magazine's address in the phone book, these were the pre-internet days, and rode my rickety bike over to a nondescript office building, walked up the dark staircase to the second floor and knocked. No answer. So I slipped my envelope underneath the door and rode home. Two weeks later, I had three cartoons in print and a check for about 75 bucks. I was in the funny business and I was hooked. So in some circles, I tell people it was James Joyce who made me a cartoonist, and in other circles, I say it was Elton John. <laughs> Cartooning is something that I always did, but never something that I quite expected that I would do for a living. I can go back, though, to one very important moment in middle school. I was in a card shop in Wellesley, Massachusetts, looking at my favorite greeting card artist, a man whose last name was Boynton. There were simple, happy, watercolor drawings of hippos and cats and turkeys. Each card was some funny saying on the inside. I loved them. I had traced them so many times, I could pretty much do them, draw the characters myself. And while I was standing at the cards, I overheard two women talk about the artist. His first name was what? Sandra? Sandra Boynton? A woman had drawn these cards? Grown women draw? So my next thought was, wow. If she could do it, then I could too. 
What's interesting about tonight is that this is the very first time that I've been on a, car on a panel about cartooning with another woman, and the panel is not called Women in Cartooning. <laughs> so Sage, now you lean over into the mic and say in your best Virginia Slims voice, you've come a long way, baby. <laughs> So after I returned from Ireland and finished up my studies at Stanford, I was living in San Francisco and called up the book review editor at the San Francisco Chronicle. In their weekly review section, they had single panel New Yorker-like strips. So I called her up and showed it to her and sh showed her the strips and she liked them and she put them in a place where she couldn't sell advertising space for that week. So note a change now between the relationship between cartoons and newspapers here that's, that's different from the Pulitzer Hearst story. By this time, cartoons in general are good little pieces of content, but they're not the great draw, pardon the pun, that they once were. That aside, seeing them in print motivated me to send, them, uh, send samples off to the syndicates. I was syndicated by King Features, or I am syndicated by King Features, who is coincidentally owned by Hearst. Hearst Entertainment, and have been drawing and writing Rhymes with Orange since then. The strip turns 15 on July 19th, and I did the math, uh, the math today, and I'll be on my 5,475th strip. Doing a daily, yeah, thanks, people. Um, doing a daily strip has a certain athleticism to it. You work up a, mon a mental muscle by doing it every day. I've got physical proof too. As you can easily see, even through the airwaves, the radio waves of Cam Cambridge Forum, my drawing finger callus could cook sand on Arnold Schwarzenegger's drawing finger callus, I am sure. There's a myth about creativity that it visits you. When you do a job that demands creative output, you can't wait for creativity to visit you. That's too passive. You visit it like a bounty hunter or a debt collector. So here are the secrets that I know for getting cartoon ideas. I start most days with a certain special yoga position. It's called derriere in the chair. There's another name for it when I'm not talking over the radio waves and the, and the FCC isn't listening, and it sounds more like a fish sitting in a chair, like bass in the chair. If I don't practice derriere in the chair, that is literally making myself sit down at a desk to do work, very little gets done. I think funny cartoons are a three-way of words, pictures, and anxiety. There's some misunderstanding, or even better, something's gone horribly wrong, but it's just make-believe, so you can laugh at it guilt-free. And you laugh at it, I think, because it reminds you that you're not the only one who experiences humiliation or rejection. That there are other people who say the wrong thing, or trip while they're carrying their groceries, or feel pathetic or self-conscious. For me, creating cartoons is a daily exercise in making friends with all of the horrible things I might fear about myself, and then using them for fun and profit. So say I find myself, after a particularly rough day, strip mining a half gallon of Rocky Road ice cream for the marshmallows. I can say, wait, this isn't just a sad and desperate moment. This is a cartoon idea. And then I draw from the experience. So that strip came, up, the strip that evolved from that is a woman in her therapist's office and the therapist is giving her a piece of paper and she's going, prescription th strength ice cream, thank you doctor. <laughs> they say that cartoonists are either writers who draw or artists who write. And I put myself in that first category. I always start with the writing. I read a lot and I take notes, not on events, but on topics. I look at the calendar to see what holidays are coming up. I thought about Earth Day, which is tomorrow, about five weeks ago, and because there's that lag time between the time I draw the strip and when it actually appears in the paper. I have a hoodlum cat and an overly large dog, and they provide cartoon ideas as long as I provide them kibble. Another uh, way that I get ideas comes from a brainstorming exercise that I learned when I was reading an interview by the, about, or an interview on, with, with, the um, BC cartoonist Johnny Hart. I call it the justification game. I take a piece of paper and I fold it lengthwise. On the left side, 
I write down a list of 10 professions or animals, whatever comes to my head. On the left side, I'll write down 10 situations or props without looking at what's over on the right, uh, on the left side. <laughs> then I take one from each side and I try to justify why this nonsensical pairing would take place. So one time I found that I had a snake on one side and a ball of yarn on the other. And I asked myself what could be the connection or relationship between them. So that became a strip about a snake with a ball of yarn next to him reading a book called Anyone Can Knit. <laughs> the last way that I get ideas is from funny things that friends or fans say or send to me. There's a pretty, another pretty entrenched myth about creativity and that, the, and that it is a one-person show. I don't buy it. For me, I enjoy it more when I open myself up for collaboration. So if someone offers me even a seed of an idea, I like to acknowledge and thank that person in the corner of my strip. It's fun for me, and it creates a relationship to my readers that I really enjoy. So if any of you have an idea, go to my website, rhymeswithorange.com. So far, I've talked a lot about the process of getting ideas, and that's the first half of the work. The second half is about translating the drawing, it's translating the idea into an actual drawing and into an actual punchline. Each idea could be drawn many different ways. Should it be two women talking to each other? Should it be a man and a woman talking, a dog talking, a flow chart? It's all about making choices with the goal of presenting the joke in the clearest, fastest possible way. You always want good design, one where the action sends your eye from the left to the right. In terms of the punchline, there are two hard and fast clarity rules. One, you save the funniest word for the end, and two, the fewer words the better. For a daily strip, you've got six inches of space to tell a story that can only be two and a half inches tall, so economy helps. The actual materials that I use to draw the strip are really old school. Pencils, pens, whiteout. With the exception of a scanner, my office can fit in a Ziploc bag. One of the magical things about cartooning is that there isn't a wrong way to draw it. I wasn't sure how, uh, I, I, how to talk about this until I got a chance to meet one of my cartoon idols, uh, the picture book artist, Ed Emberley. I was at the Eric Carle Museum of Picture Book Art in Hadley, Massachusetts, and I showed him my cartoon collection, and he said, you're like me. You don't draw things. You draw symbols of things. So if I draw what looks like two vertical worms with a horizontal worm bouncing on top, and you see it as a table, and that's how I want you to see it, my work is done. So Ed and I started uh, corresponding about cartooning and how magic can be made in just a few pen strokes. One day he wrote me this. Think how you might feel if one dark night you met a creature with a head like a large swollen marshmallow, two black burnt holes for eyes, a large lipless toothless mouth, a few long black hairs and a dwarf body. What thoughts does that inspire? Fear or pleasure? Could it inspire love? So who was he describing? He was describing good old Charlie Brown. What's interesting about drawing cartoons is that while it's a very effective shorthand, it exists with some really strict cultural limitations. Remember how I was talking about how to present the joke and should I use a man and a woman talking? If I did, you as the reader would instinctively know that this was going to be a relationship strip. So as an artist, and someone who's in a same-sex relationship herself, how can I reference the experience of a relationship without tying it to men and women, and therefore making it a joke about gender stereotypes? So how can it be done? Sometimes I use furry monsters instead of people, or I use cute animals. What's amazing to me is how often I see two animals in a comic strip and the female animal wears a bow and lipstick. One day I just want to see two bears who look like bears talking, or have one of the bears look like a bear and the other one be wearing tidy whities and a remote control. It's ironic to have this incredible drawing freedom and at the same time this limiting framework. Cartooning uh, for a living is a real mix of work and play. I was talking to a lawyer friend of mine the other day and asking for her help about, um, about 
them about a Memorial Day cartoon <clears throat> because that's what was coming up for last week. Um, we started talking about cookouts and hot dog buns and lighting the grill and who would be there. And she said, okay, she was listing friends and neighbors. And I said, well, what about dragons? And she said, right, this is a cartoon world. <laughs> dragons get to come into your cartoons. Dragons don't get to come into my law cases. That part is so fun. The hard part is when you try and try and no, and no dragons come to your cookout. Um, <clears throat> I face despair that I will never get any more cartoon ideas almost every Tuesday. I joke about it, but it is hard. Sometimes I try to cheer myself out of it using math, like if I did it last week, and if I did it the week before, and if I did it the week before that, then statistically speaking, there's a really good chance that I'm gonna do it this week. Sometimes I call a friend for consolation or take the dog out. I have to give the bounty hunter a rest and hope the creative muse will peek, come peek her nose out when I am not staring her down. When people ask about how to get into cartooning, the most important thing is to forget about coming up with an original concept. It's your authentic, personal take on a universal concept that people relate to. Here's the best example I have of this. There was this syndicate salesman. A syndicate acts like your agent. They go around and they, and they peddle your strips to newspapers. So a syndicate salesman walks into a newspaper editor's office, this is in the 80s, and he says, I've got a great new strip about a man going to work. The editor says, he's got his feet up on the desk, we already have that. It's called Blondie. Can you guess the name of the strip the syndicate, the syndicate sales guy was holding in his hand? It was Dilbert. <laughs> so even... Although even with Dilbert's success, newspaper cartooning is in a place of transition right now. There are no six paper towns and people go to CNN, NPR, the Huffington Post, the Drudge Report, and Cambridge Forum for their news. It's not that the appetite for news and entertainment hasn't changed, but the medium for it has. Newsprint is certainly alive, but not as robust, and comics are read for free on the internet. But already that's changing with the advent of the iPhone and the iPad and your various smartphones, because people buy apps in order to, to look at things. Uh, this might be the future of newspaper cartooning. Time will tell. So I'll now uh, let people ask questions. Thank you. Um, I guess I'd like to ask a, a few questions. And um, you mentioned Sandra Boynton and, and an earlier time in your life when you cartooned or you drew. But I was wondering for both of you, were you doodlers as children? Um, this is Sage. Um, uh, yes, I was, I was definitely a doodler. I, I was obsessive as a drawer as a child. I, um, I liked to read, but I was, it was like I had itchy fingers or something. I would draw every night, and my mom would let me stay up late past my bedtime as long as I didn't come out and bother anybody. I could stay up late, and I would just draw pictures. So. And were you? I was a doodler on notebook on uh, phone books. That was my medium, the side of them. Um, and I enjoyed drawing. I enjoyed doodling, and I enjoyed um, the How to Draw Cartoons book by Walter Lanks, which was this big, oversized book. Um, and then when I went to an artsy high school, but I, I was not the artist at, the, at that school. I was, I was an athlete. And so I kind of dropped, I dropped it for a little while and then kind of picked it up when I was uh, in college and would draw <clears throat> pictures for friends during slideshows in human biology class. And then would post it up on their wall and, you know, got... got praise for that and enjoyed it. So. Um, I guess you both oh, say. This is Hillary. <laughs> you both say that um, writing the caption or the words is import an important part. But um, after the creative process unfolds and you have the completed work, do you ever drop the words out? Uh, given that, I, I don't know what you'd call it, the homily or whatever, that a picture's worth a thousand words. Do you ever just leave the words out after you've done it? The words have stimulated you, but unnecessary. Um, this is Sage. Um, I, do, I, don't, I can't think of an example where I took all the words out. There may be one. Um, 
I do have, I often, if I come up with an idea, I like to um, run it by a couple people to make sure that it has the impact because sometimes it's like if I come back to it cold a little while later, I can tell if it worked. But if I'm in a hurry, which I usually am, I want to know, does, it, does somebody get it? And some of the, there are two people that I usually ask. One of them always says, cut out these words. He, like, I just know he's always going to say, take, take some of the words out. So I always keep that in mind. And sometimes he's right, and sometimes I ignore what he's saying. But I often do end up trying to pare it down a bit. I think I start out a little wordier than I need to be. My experience is also is by showing it to someone. This is Hillary. Uh, and um, on Thursday mornings, generally, I meet with an old office mate of mine who's a graphic designer. And graphic designers are all about the interplay between words and pictures. And so she's absolutely a great person to talk to. And uh, again, I'm in a hurry. So I, I don't have the luxury of putting something away for a, in a drawer and coming back to it four weeks later. And so she does a really good job of, in exchange for breakfast, uh, she will uh, look at my strips and say, this works, this doesn't. Um, you forgot to draw the feet on these people. And uh, you could really cross out a few words. I, the goal is less, and I find that if I look back on my earlier strips, there's a lot more words to it. There are more words to it than, than there are now. And then again, for both of you, um, I was thinking as I was trying to think how I would des describe your books and your compilations, you're both author illustrators. But it, and then I thought those two words don't make sense. A cartoonist does both. But do you think of yourselves as in two different categories of creativity uh, as author and as as illustrator you write the words and you draw the pictures and uh, sage for instance you do both for your children's books but some children's book authors will write the words and uh, somebody else will illustrate mm -hmm. so cartoonists though always do um, both um, no, I think, I think sometimes they collaborate with, like, somebody has the ideas and somebody else does the pictures, or maybe they both do ideas and somebody does the pictures. Um, I think if I saw that somebody was a cartoonist next to a strip, I would just assume that they did both. Although, I think sometimes, I mean, with the syndicates, a lot of times they'll have, they'll secretly be hiring somebody to, to do some of the coloring and, um, you know, if, or they, they are no longer alive and there's, you know, carrying on the strip, the whole strip, somebody is kind of the ghost cartoonist. So sometimes it gets muddied, but mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I think of it as one thing, I think. And then that brought up, oh, or do you, do you want to answer that or talk about that? I think that I, this is Hillary, and I think that I, I, I enjoy the interplay of, of one off the other. I begin always with the words, but, um, then I try to take as much out and fill as much in with the drawing. Because, again, there's an economy to it. It goes faster. So. Now, with Jody, did she, I didn't read the Jody um, series of, was it four years then, of Jody? And yeah. so did she grow as a person during those four years? Um, not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, she kind of, she went through her college experience, so um, things happened, th things happened along the way, and she, the, the cast of characters got bigger because more people sort of got worked into it, I think. Um, but I was, because it was once a week, it wasn't, um, if you look at the, the final collection in the end, there weren't so many, so that it's not like there could be all these subtle ways that she could be, that her demeanor could be changing or that she, um, you know, there were like relationships happening with the different characters and that sort of thing. But I don't think that um, she changed as a person. I think, I mean, and that's another thing about cartoons. They're kind of, there is a kind of rigidity and stereotypicalness to a certain extent. You can't, oftentimes you have to have them wearing the same clothes all the time or you, or you unless you're an amazing artist so that they can t tell from the facial features and everything. So, um, you know, if they were getting new hairdos and things like that, um, it would have had to have been a big event in the strip, and then she would always have to have the same hairdo after that, or something like that. So, um, there was one. There was one character who went off on a hiking trip and came back and was, you know, a total hippie after that. And, um, so there were two people, 
did develop, I guess, in some ways. And when did you decide to write children's books as well? Or how did you morph into a child's book writer? Um, let's see. Well, that was, it was almost separate. My grandmother was a children's book uh, illustrator and um, also just an illustrator uh, freelance. And when I was little, I thought she was really cool. She always said, don't become an illustrator. You'll never make any money, which was true. <laughs> um, but at the time she died, I was pretty young. She thought I was going to be a surgeon, so she was happy. But, um, <laughs> um, but anyway, so and it, one thing that's interesting about my grandmother is that she died when I was pretty young, but my years later, when my style had emerged as whatever it was going to be, my sister-in-law was going through some old photo albums with my brother, and she said, why did Sage put all these pictures of your dad as a baby into the pictures, into the photo album? And he was, he was, that is weird. And then they realized it was my grandmother's pictures, and they looked just like mine, which was kind of uncanny. But um, so it was, it was always something that was kind of in my mind as something that I might be interested in. And after I graduated from college, I had um, lived around Cambridge and had moved away, not very far, it was in Brookline, but I missed, I missed Harvard Square. And so I, um, I had read somewhere that if you're interested in getting into children's books, um, you have to come up with a, a uh, text. So when I sat down to do something, what I ended up with um, probably wasn't the best for marketing. There wasn't a story to it or anything, but I wrote a little Dr. Susie style poem, kind of an ode to Harvard Square. And then when I was going to illustrate it, I realized that I would have to draw all these tableaus and landscapes and buildings that people would recognize, and I didn't draw that well at that point. And I just put it in a drawer. And then it was years later, I had been on vacation for fun. I would do sketching. And I started to think that they were starting to look nice. And then I thought, well, maybe I should practice when I'm at home, too. So I took the, took the text back out, and I started trying to fill in for the, each line. I'd go and stand in Harvard Square and draw pictures. So that's kind of how that started. I'm thinking of Doonesbury, and I don't know how many decades Doonesbury has been um, around. But those characters definitely, from day one to the current day, have changed a great deal. And um, the Charles Schultz biography uh, that came out a few years ago made it clear to me that Charlie Brown, even though he looked the same, the Charlie Brown of the first strip was not the Charlie Brown who had so many life experiences <laughs> at the end of, of, of Charles Schultz's life. Um, do either of you feel at this point in the arc of your careers that you might again stick with a character but see how it goes as you age and integrate your own experiences into the cartoons? I would say, this is Hillary, I would say that I don't have a character that has a name. Although, you know, when you have a dream and you're everyone in the dream, they say, you're the psychiatrist, you tell me. But, uh, uh, but oftentimes the strip is semi-autobiographical, truthy versus the absolute truth. Um, and I've perhaps changed a little bit about how that character looks. But because I don't, I don't have a, a, a set stable of characters, I think that I like the being fast and loose. Um, I think that, that the only thing that has changed is that I've gotten to be a better drawer and so might fill in more of the background than I would before. Not that I fill it in much, but I draw a better hedge than I used to. Um, I, want it, I guess I do want to open it to the audience, but what did the two of you think about the New Yorker contest where they put a cartoon and then the audience writes in their captions? They pick three final captions and then it seems to me some of them I don't understand, but any one of them would probably suit as well. Um, but what do you, I wondered what two cartoonists would think about allowing an audience to throw a caption on. I mean, it's, it, it's a clever idea for, I think, I think people enjoy participating in it. Um, it's sort of backwards. I, there was one year when the book The Naked Cartoonist came out by Robert Mankoff, and I got it from like five people for Christmas, I think. But it was, it talks about how some people come up with ideas by doing pictures and then 
do doodles and then try to come up with ideas to put on it. And some people come up with ideas and they put the pictures on. Um, that's definitely going backwards with, with um, the image and then supplying the picture. Um, it was interesting because I, I saw Bob Mankoff speak twice and both times he kind of said that cartooning is very specialized. Not anyone can do cartooning. That people like doctors and people are always sending him ideas and he explains, you know, I wouldn't go and I would try to do surgery now. So I thought it was funny <laughs> that the, the caption contest started and it was kind of opening it up to everyone. It seemed kind of antithetical to the cartooning as this special priesthood or something. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It seems like sort of a gimmick, I guess. And I think it would be fun as a cartoonist to come up with the weird scenes that suggest things, but you're not responsible for coming up with something. Um, this is Hillary. My syndicate did a, has started to do some caption contests and have asked me to do a few. And it's such a relief to not have the joke and just draw a picture. So when I look at the caption contests, I haven't, I haven't given it much thought. I always look at them, and I'm always pretty impressed with the captions that people come up with. But I think I'd be lousy at it, because it is going backwards for me. And then Sage, I see you as a political commentator. And Hillary, I see you as more like Seinfeld. You're talking about life. But that's a commentary, too. Uh, would you both agree with that kind of um, assessment of the two of you? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not as political as, I think there are some people who come to political cartooning uh, primarily because they have a really strong viewpoint and they want to use their cartooning as a tool to um, get their, their side and their view across. I'm more sort of, I'm often trying to find some twist or something that isn't what would be expected, so um, I tend to not be consistently arguing things from some particular viewpoint, but it is sort of topical, current events, and oftentimes I do have an opinion about it that I'll try to get in there. But but if I have sometimes if I have an opinion on something, if I still can't think of some cartoony thing twist that makes it feel like this is a cartoon that would kind of get off the ground and do something, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do a cartoon just to get my viewpoint across. It would be more if I could come up with something that I liked as a cartoon. I find that the constraints of the job with the deadline for me, that doing events, uh, political events, are impossible. So the structure informs what I'm going to what I'm going to actually uh, be able to to cartoon about. So. Because, like I said, I've got a five-week lag time between the, ti the time I do the daily and when it appears in the newspaper, and then for the Sunday, that's, it's a six-week mm -hmm. lag time. So I find that if I come up with something, I have to think, well, does this have legs? You know, if certain senator so-and-so misbehaves, probably six weeks from now, another certain so-and-so senator, senator is going to do that. But so I can do something about the so-and-so senators and their silly ways. I can do something broader like that, but I, but I couldn't you know, name names. And so um, it's funny when the axle of evil uh, axis, ax, ax, I don't know, well, whenever it came out, I came up with, a, with an idea about, okay, you have a guy and he's uh, an old lady is at the, at the garage mechanics, and the mechanic is saying, what you have here, miss, is the axle of evil. <laughs> but I sat on it for a long time. It came to me immediately, but I sat on it for a long time because I didn't know if it had any legs. And so it did, and no one, no one got to it first, so I could drop the cartoon. So could people come up and ask questions? Otherwise, I, I have more, but please come up. Come up. Come to the mic. This is a question primarily for Sage. Um, you mentioned uh, web comics as a way to uh, reach an audience that isn't as deeply penetrated as uh, with newspaper reading as it used to. 
Um, what does this mean for political cartoonists? Are a lot of people reading their political cartoons on Kegel, for example? Um, how is the, uh, the gentleman who had the animation that got the Pulitzer, how is he distributing his work? Um, I think a lot of them do have websites. I think it goes both ways, though. Like you say, the, uh, the Kegel site, some people are ambivalent about that because... You might want to explain what the Kegel site oh, is. There, uh, there's a, car a cartoonist named Daryl Kegel who, in addition to cartooning, um, he runs some, it's kind of like a syndicate where he, he, I don't think he pays very much, but he gets, kind of aggregates all, a lot of the cartoons on his site. And um, people can just go there and get their cartoons. And there's also um, these ways that you can kind of sign up for a service and choose, like it's, it's cheaper to not have a staff cartoonist and to instead sign up for a service where you get every day all the editorial cartoonists that are being done for a certain syndicate service. And then if somebody has a, a week day and everybody does, then you just go with somebody else, but it doesn't serve the cartoonist very well because they're not, then you can just lay them off and then they don't have benefits. But so then it's a matter of, you know, this is one of the, the issues that's, that's discussed all the time. You know, they try to make the case that it's important to have your own hometown staff cartoonist who knows your issues and, um, you know, has a presence and is cartooning about local issues in addition to national issues. But the market, the, um, the online market can help some people if they s establish their own site and find ways to, to sell their stuff that way, but it also kind of devalues a lot of it all at once together. So it's uh, unclear how that's gonna play out. I want to ask Hillary, particularly because you do both a daily strip and a Sunday strip, about to talk a little bit about the differences, if there are differences, between the kind of thinking you need to do for the longer, bigger Sunday strip versus the daily joke. Um, and I'm particularly interested in hearing you reflect on the work that Bill Watterson did to open up the Sunday strip in particular and to remove some of the rigidity and those boundaries when he did his Calvin and Hobbes with the one big opening panel and those kinds of things. I can speak to that, but I think I'll, I'll need to speak about it separately. Uh, Bill Waterston is a very, very gifted artist, and so I think it was his artistry, for one, that he chose to uh, get rid of the traditional boxes and paste the cartoon very differently, and that was a very um, revolutionary thing to do. It was either revolutionary or it was also going back to the birth of the Sunday comics, not so much the yellow kid that I talked about, but it used to be that a comics page, that each comic got a, almost a whole page to themselves. So somebody like Windsor McKay um, could do really beautifully, graphically complex uh, work. Um, what had happened since the times of Windsor McKay to where we are today is that the comic strip shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And Bill Watterson had the clout because of the popularity of Calvin and Hobbes to say, I'm not going to run my strip as small as you run the other strips. Doonesbury also did the same thing because of the clout that he had. And as a result, he pushed back against the newspapers which were driven by the rising price of newsprint. I mean, everything has an, has an economic factor to go with it. But he had the clout to say, this is how I'm going to do it. And he also had the talent to back it up. So that's answer number one about uh, how I choose my, of the seven that I do each week, which one I'm, gonna, which one I'm going to turn into a Sunday, when I am Coming up with the seven ideas, oftentimes I don't know which of the seven at that moment is going to be the Sunday. Sometimes I do, but sometimes I don't. And so I'll look at the seven and I'll go, well, which one can best benefit 
from color. How can, the, how can color propel the joke? So that's one of the things that I think about. Also, if it gives me an opportunity to make a more complex drawing if I need to. If I have many characters, they're pretty squished in a six by two and a half inch square. So this gives them a little bit more breathing room. So that's another thing that I take into account. And then the final thing is the theme of the joke. Monday through Saturday is a place where I feel like you can have more mature themes. Uh, whereas Sunday, I try to choose the absolute most kind of family friendly um, strip because I feel like there are all ages reading it. And certainly I can have subtle humor in there, um, but, the, but I, I want to reach a, a, a broad audience. So that's how I choose. And often if I feel like it's got just kind of the most broad, fun appeal. I want to quickly follow up with a color question because the Globe has been printing the daily comics in color, except for the night their color man is off, I guess. Um, then they come out in black and white the next day. Um, has, has that become a general trend, and does it require you to do more coloring yourself? What has happened now is that uh, syndicates realize that if they pitched a color strip that readers would respond very well to it. It's been very popular among readers to have color in their daily strips. Um, from an artist's perspective, when I'm drawing the strip as a daily strip, I can't think in color. I mean, I could, but it's a, something that in half the newspapers it'll be in black and white and half the newspapers it'll be in color. Um, since I've been doing this for 15 years now, in my contract, there's nothing that says I have to color my strips. What I do now is I have a relationship with the artist at the syndicate who colors many strips, and I'll put color notes with all of the strips that I do. So if I feel like, I feel like I've given her a style sheet, she's got a general idea of what kind of colors that I like, and this took some time to get to. Um, because one person's light blue is not another person's light blue. One person's Easter spring colors are not another's. Um, and so nowadays, I'll just say, if it's really important to me that the Merlot be red, I'll make sure to, to write that the Merlot be red because there's, I've done jokes where it gets miscolored and the joke gets lost as a result of con the confusion around that. Um, I think in present cartoonist contracts, when if you're signing up today, you sign up to color your strip, which adds a ton of work on top of it, because it takes me an hour or so to do a Sunday strip. A lot of people have their spouses coloring the strip. It becomes a cottage industry. Any other questions? No? I'm trying to think of my question as I came to the microphone. Uh, but it does seem that comics are, are so fleeting, so instantaneous, and so brief. Uh, I, I, I have a quick experience or quick relationship with a strip, and then it's gone off the horizon. And I wonder, uh, even though you've sort of steered away from some of the political uh, inclinations or inclination to um, embed political uh, opinions and views into your strips. I'm wondering if you're if you're drawn in the long term to that sort of direction, and what is it that you deeply want to say over the long term in your strips? And or put another way, uh, people have a quick reaction generally to strips on a daily basis. But what what's the lasting impression you want to leave with with people in your strips over the long term? This is Hillary. And to answer your question, the medium that I draw in is, is a very fleeting me medium. It's news today and it's hamster, hamster litter tomorrow. But I feel like what I am looking for <clears throat> or what I find uh, to be a success is, is, is if I can nail an experience that people will look at it and go, that's so true. That's the piece, whether, whether it's just for that moment, that is the piece that uh, I strive for as a, as a cartoonist. 
and as a humorist. Sage, do you feel as strongly as Hillary that you'd like to see more women doing cartooning? Um, I, I'm not, I guess I, had, I hadn't really been aware that there weren't as many till I, when I was in college, there was an event, um, there were, I was invited and there was another cartoonist who was invited, was both female, uh, to a Neiman event. And at, at that event, I remember the people at our table, because uh, Doug Marlette was coming to speak and we were invited because we were the people cartooning then. And all the people at the table were saying, Oh, it's so amazing that, that, the, that the two cartoonists are women. And I, and I said, really? It, it hadn't occurred to me, I guess. Um, but um, once I started going to these editorial cartoon conventions, then it was kind of like, where, where are all the rest of them? <laughs> you know? So yeah, it seems like, especially for, for political and editorial cartoons, it seems like it, it would be nice to have, have uh, more diversity of voices getting heard on a regular basis. So. And Hillary, what are you doing to help women or to bring more women into the field? Um, well, I think there are a couple different things. I've had uh, an intern last year that I've been mentoring. Um, I feel like for both uh, f male and female young cartoonists, if people say, I've got questions, any young person that writes to me um, with questions, I will try and send them in the right direction or I will say, send me your stuff, and I'd be happy to critique it. Can an old person write to you? <laughs> yes, yes. There's no age cutoff. Okay. Um, absolutely. And I also think that by talking about cartooning, by modeling being a cartoonist, mm -hmm. that that is something that happens in a way that is not a direct piece, but in the same way that I was influenced by walking into a card shop, that seeing a face attached to a profession that isn't generally the face that you'd see, something with much smoother, peachy skin like myself, um, no, that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that uh, does the job also. All right. Um, should we close? I, we started late, so I... Yes. Okay, go ahead. I was interested in both your opinions about uh, the comic strip Zippy, which I, I never understand and I never have, and its longevity is sort of beyond me. So am I missing something? <laughs> this is Hillary. This is Hillary. Um, I don't understand quantum physics either, but a lot of people do. Um, I have an interesting story about Bill Griffith, and that is that he goes around and he's a very gifted artist, and so he will uh, draw. There's a diner in my town, and he'll, he'll, draw the, he'll draw the diner, and then you'll see the diner in the strip, but I'll, he gets a lot of attention for what it is that he's drawing. And um, people used to say, you know, he used to say, oh, I'm a cartoonist, and that would engender a long discussion. And so I heard, this is just hearsay, that he now just says, like real estate illustrator or something like that to avoid attention. Um, yeah, I don't really get don't really get the strip either. Um, <laughs> but my I should say my my cousin seems to like it. He and he my cousin I, I mean this is from years back. I don't know if he still follows it, but my cousin was uh, like a computer science PhD at MIT, so I just assumed there was some subtle <laughs> message that was <laughs> over my head that it was, <laughs> you had to be a, a science genius or something to, to have it speak to you on your frequency, so. But, uh, this is Hillary again. I, I think that s cartoons can speak to us in a lot of different ways. While I might be looking for a punchline, that's my focus, other people can really just bask in the artwork or, or bask in the fact that here's something that's groovy, that some people get and some people don't, and they might just celebrate the fact that it gets to exist on the page. I, don't think, I, I suspect it wouldn't continue to exist if, it, if there weren't people that it does speak to, and I think it's, it is probably the absurdism of, of it that people like. I guess I never thought about it for a long time, but the covers of The New Yorker, are, are they just illustrations or are they cartoon-like? Um, yeah, I, I looked at Sempe, and there's always a small person or a small creature, 
And so I realized finally Sempi must be saying something <laughs> about big and small or overwhelmed or underwhelmed or whatever. But I guess it, what would one call that? Uh, I think it's some, maybe somewhere in between. I think some of the covers are done by uh, artists and illustrators, and but there are a lot that are done by cartoonists, and some some seem more specifically cartoon-like. Um, there was the one that caused the uproar sometime in 2008 with, uh, I think it was Obama and his wife fist pumping each other, and um, it was Barry Blitt, and he's a kind of a somewhere between a cartoonist and an illustrator. So I would say that would be kind of more like a cartoon. Um, the sensibility, I, I think, just from looking at someone, I, I once looked through a book of old New Yorker covers, and I think they were more in the past, maybe just kind of pretty pictures, and now they seem a little more arch and wry and little sort of jokes inserted. But they don't have, I don't think they have punchlines necessarily. Hi, I was curious about um, how com computer-aided design and, and um, graphic programs might be influencing the cartoon world, or is there anybody that's doing cartooning um, on the computer as opposed to hand drawing. I'm in the design field as a landscape architect. There's a lot more people that are learning the design professions um, by drawing on computer, and there's a big difference between, you know, the tactile experience of um, pen and pen and pencil on paper and a 314 uh, pencil with a lot of graphite versus, you know, uh, the computer and. Maybe you have some comments on that. Um, let's see. Well, I know that a lot more cartoonists, I think now are, it's kind of a hybrid. Like uh, when I, I mostly just draw stuff, but I couldn't do it now without Photoshop to move everything around when I need to. But I know some people who um, just do the line drawings and then they color the whole thing um, on the computer. And um, I was reading somewhere recently that now online, they have things called co comics generators, and you can you can plug in. Um, for, I guess it's for people who can't draw, and it's it's like you can design your own characters, and then you can pick backgrounds. And I wouldn't be surprised if this be, starts to become more and more elaborate and involved. I have uh, nieces and nephews who they they like to go to these uh, sites that aren't aren't to make cartoons, but that you can design your own alien and things like that. So I imagine if the kids are, this is what they do for fun, they're kind of used to doing this. I could see a whole generation of cartoonists not needing to know how to draw and getting very sophisticated with grabbing backgrounds. And, and then there's also um, Tom Tomorrow, who does a lot of kind of clip art for his, uh, I think he, it's almost like he assembles it from a kit and he, he draws some of it, but a lot of it is kind of pasted in from other photoshopped images. So I think that, I think that will be increasing, I imagine. Uh, I know a couple cartoonists who draw their strip entirely online using a Cintiq tablet, which is basically a tablet with an electronic pencil on it. Um, I find that I, I draw with pencil and paper because I, en I enjoy it, not because it's, an, it's not faster nor is it slower, it's just more aesthetically pleasing and it's more familiar. So it's, it allows what I do to have a certain joy to it. Um, I, don't, I certainly don't look down on the computer people. I feel like the, the technology, the, the pencil is technology and the computer is a pencil 2.0. Um, so. There's that. The other thing that I think um, doesn't happen with a computer is that you don't get to look at the originals. So it's always fun to, to, to get up really close and see the kind of the, the hand-hewn uh, work that's created. And t for me, there's always like whiteout blobs and Cheeto dust and all this kind of stuff um, that I... I I, no one would know about unless they actually saw the original drawing. So there's a, it's always fun to, to hold something, but that could be just because I'm more old school. I want to come back to the title we picked for this program, Framing the Story, and you both described your work process as coming up with words first 
and then trying to fit it into the format of the cartoon, whether that's one of your circular Sunday strips or whether that's a daily four panel cartoon. And I wonder if you could each look a little more at that process of having the words and then picking out what is going to go into that frame. What does that process of framing parts of the story do? What do you have to leave out? Does it ever become impossible to simplify that much? And what does it add to simplify and create these four distinct chapters or these eight distinct pictures? whether you could consider cartooning um, poems as opposed to prose, because there, there, there are holes that have to be filled in by the, the viewer or the, the person who looks at it. Well, I don't generally see it as poetry, I would see, but if I had to, it would be somewhere between a haiku and a limerick. Um, I would see it as a very short story with a surprise ending. Um, Poetry, you know, I guess I would see the drawing more as poetry than I'd see the writing as poetry because the drawing is about uh, just getting the symbol. You get the symbol, we move on type of thing. And, and uh, the drawing is about the imagery more than the text is. Um, I'm trying to think the... I mean, I guess I'm, I'm often surprised with the small space, um, especially for the panels, that I don't think I've ever not been able to get in whatever it was that I was trying to establish. And um, I sometimes feel like, uh, like with Harold and the Purple Crayon, like you just, you have your pen and you can fill in whatever you need as the background and just, just a little suggestion of, of a curtain or a, plant or, or and it establishes kind of like this is the context of the world that we're the kind of room that we're in or that we're outside or um, mm -hmm. um, but it does kind of concentrate your mind in a different way depending on how much space you have and um, you know some of the cartoons that I work on have different orientation like the Provincetown's banner is uh, portrait size which I found is very hard to it's easier to do kind of a landscape when you're trying to establish what's going on in the scene with people next to each other. And when it's portrait size, you kind of have uh, people standing behind each other and things that I wouldn't have thought of as um, being that hard. And then I realized there's a reason why most, most cartoons are not shaped like that. But uh, I feel like it's probably good practice to, to have to do it that way. Hi. I noticed that both of you usually center on doing single panel cartoons and some other comic strips have storylines, you know, continuing characters. And I was wondering if either of you have thought about doing that or how you might go about um, pursuing a continuing storyline with, continu with uh, reoccurring characters. This is Hillary. I, I think for me that I've never thought in character and always thought in content in terms of, and always thought in vignette. So it's been difficult for me as to, it, it would be economically much smarter for me to be doing a strip with characters because of plush toys. But <laughs> that said, um, that's not in the cards for me. It's not really how I think. Um, so I can see myself in outside of the medium of cartooning. I, I wrote a play with a friend, um, or I've been working on one with a friend, and that's all character-based. And I think that taking it outside of the cartoon strip, outside of my kind of job, made it a lot easier to play with characters because um, there was less writing on it for me. But I think that... Uh, Characters are a very smart way to go. If you think about the kind of real estate on the newspaper page, there are a lot more long skinnies than there are square strips. 
And so for people that are, syndicates want characters, they want people to identify and say, hey, what's Lucy Van Pelt up to today? Hey, what's Jeremy Duncan of Zitz? What's he, what's he doing today? Um, it's, it's, people care about the characters. So um, it's a smart way to go. And, and I did do a, a, a comic strip in college at, that had the cast of characters, and I enjoyed it. So, um, I mean, I guess I could envision at some point reviving, I, you know, Jody, however many years down the road or something like that. But um, it's not something that I'm currently ruminating on, I guess. So, Jody, oldie. Right, in the old folks' home. And <laughs> it does sound definitely like doodlers should not be given detention, though. They should be sent to the doodling room and continue. <laughs> but I don't know if you both know that I, I really think, working with children, that cartoons could be great for kids with learning disabilities. You know, do they miss a piece of it? Do they get the point? Do they only get the details, or do they get the big picture? Um, you know, I think that there's a place for cartoons in education. I don't know if any of your cartoons have been called upon by teachers or if teachers have called you. I think another high compliment is to find out that you were put as the entertainment page before a test. <laughs> um, and I think that you're right, that there are some people learn all different kinds of ways. Some people are more... Uh, visual learners and some people are more reading comprehension and I think that it suits I think that it suits kids to get as much information from as many different ways as they can in order for it to absorb in Any more questions? Come. as a follow-up to the previous gentleman's um, question uh, for strips that have recurring characters and such when faced with something like a daily deadline, do you find it's easier to go with a, an anecdotal, you know, this is my poignant thing to say today and not have to worry about continuity? Or is it, you know, easier for some people to have the continuity of a story arc that spans, you know, a dozen strips with a joke every fourth frame or so? No. Uh, this is Hillary to answer that. I get very jealous of the of the strips with a narrative, you get one story and you get to tell similar jokes, you get to build off the joke every single day. And so it's, and people aren't going, when they like a strip, they aren't, they aren't going, oh, that particular Wednesday was funny. They're thinking, oh, well, that, that interplay between the squirrel and the, and the bacon was funny. So they're not, they're not really focused on the, on the punchline as much. It's the scenario, and it's a whole week scenario, and so they can, it's very memorable. Um, I feel like the good news or for me is that I have a lot of freedom, and the bad news is that I can't tell a, a, a kissing cousin, I mean, no, I mean a joke that is similar to the joke of yesterday. It's got to be different. That's the trade-off for me. Yeah, well, when I, when I used to do a comic strip, the one challenge would be you, you would need to advance the plot, so there's something like to get from here to here, something has to happen in between, but then you, it still has to have that rhythm to it of you know, something happening within the joke in the, or the punch to it. So you might end up with a weak one when you're just trying to establish that you got from here to there, but it definitely, you knew where you were going with it. Um, when I started doing a panel cartoon, somebody in my office was saying, oh, well, this will be so much easier because you just look at the news and you do it on the news, but I didn't, I was thinking, no, it's not going to be easier, and it, it wasn't, so. Okay, so we should say good night for tonight. You've been listening to a program of Cambridge Forum. I want to thank Hillary Price and Sage Stossel, sorry, Sage Stossel. <laughs>